Mona Lisa is all about me. It's all about you. It's all about our stories. The stories that never get told, but ought to. Whereby water transportation does not make financial sense, it makes economic sense. I was there for two and a half hours on the floor. Nobody attended to me. If we don't take care of the poor, the poor will take care of us. It's about getting at the root of things and hearing from the horse's mouth. We have 15 public hospitals to make them affordable. In the whole of Africa, we are bigger. You know, Nigeria, we sleep, eat, dream, fashion. Those with the uh, financial backing don't see fashion as an investment, which makes no sense. If they do it for free, they won't have money for the next case. Mona Lisa is about real life and the real lives, yours and mine. Make a date with Mona Lisa and together let's ensure that the important stories get told. Welcome to Mona Lisa where we keep you in the know with all the latest news. On today's edition, we will be looking into the state of our healthcare system. We head off to you where we hear from the horse's mouth. The commissioners of health and information. They let us know what they are getting right and what they could do better. Later, we'll be engaging with a specialist at the United Hearts Hospital to dissect the issues further. The program would be incomplete without the journey, the segment where we catch up with a personality in the public eye who has a notable story to tell. Today, we'll be featuring an eight-year-old professional photographer. I told you, we'll put you in the picture. So, make yourself comfortable. I know you won't want to miss any of this. According to statistics from the World Health Organization, Nigeria has a total expenditure on health of 4% of its GDP. This compares with 17.1% spent by the United Kingdom on health and 9.1% spent by the United States of America. A similarly depressing health profile was painted recently by Bill Gates, CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as he addressed the National Economic Council at Asarok. In upper to middle income countries, the average life expectancy is 75 years, and in lower to middle income countries, it stands at 68 years. The life expectancy in Nigeria is just at 53 years. Apparently, Nigeria is one of the most dangerous places in the world to give birth, with the fourth worst mortality rates, where one in three Nigerian children are said to be suffering from chronic malnutrition. Against this backdrop, my team and I set out to find some answers. We commenced our investigation into the state of the Nigerian health care system with Akwaibom as a specimen study. We are here in the land of promise, Uyo, where we join a remarkable journey of a life-transforming initiative which actually began on a scene of an accident. We're drawn here because of the news of compassionate care. Dr. Benjamin Oluo Jebutu, his wife and team under the BOF, Benjamin Oluo Jebutu Foundation, are here in Akwaibom to offer free surgery to 36 plus women suffering from fibroid, breast lumps, among others. In 2016, November 4th, I had a very gas accident on my way home. About 10.30, I was going home in the night, and this drunken driver ran into me and crushed my car and broke my leg in three places. Somebody called my wife to come and see me where I was, and they took me to the hospital. And I was there for two and a half hours on the floor. Nobody attended to me. I was in pain. They were giving my wife a referral note to take me to another hospital without even seeing my face. There was a missing link. That missing link was love, genuine love. And that's why we started what we're doing now and changing the narrative that we also can love and take them out of their pain. There is clearly a need for compassionate care in Akwaibom. We caught up with the Commissioner for Health to dissect the issues. Sir, if you were to pinpoint three major areas in which our healthcare system fails, please tell us, what would that be? Well, the three would have to do with equipment, but I value the aspect of healthcare givers. Many of the staff were not committed, either because of lack of morale or some of them were old before. So we have had to address that. Some of them were overworked. We are increasing the number of staff strength. 
and trying to create efficiency in what they do. So by providing the good avenue, the good atmosphere to, for you to work, you will apparently be very interested in delivering. The general hospitals have been reconstructed, refurbished, and re-equipped. The flagship hospital I'm talking about is called Ibom Specialist Hospital. It's one, and it has about the best medical facilities you can find anywhere in Africa here. And that's where we are actually creating the treatment for all the disciplines of medicine. It would appear that not everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet. We caught up with Dr. Nsikak in Yoyoko, recently in the news for what he terms a soft protest, and put the issues raised by him to the Commissioner for Information. Tell us a little bit about the unpaid salaries. Well, let me say that um, in times past, payment of salaries were never achievement in government. But in today's reality, payment of salaries is an achievement. Um, I, I say boldly, Akwaibum said is the only, one of the few states in Nigeria where salaries are paid regularly. Medicare for pregnant women, Medicare for children is free. And then we've also made sure that why, why are we fixing um, public hospitals? We're fixing public hospitals to make them affordable such that the common man can afford them. And then the Medicare, for instance, we've signed an, an, an MOU with Clinotech of Canada to manage the Ibom Specialist Hospital. Now, part of the plan is that, look, you need to also bring our people online and train them and get them ready to eventually take over and run these facilities. Akwaibom has clearly set the tone, and yet there are gaps to be filled. 2016, 25th December, we're about going to church. So I stood before a mirror, and I observed that my stomach was bloating. It was the following year, being to 17 November, that was when I went for a scan. And that was when I found out that I had fibroid. It was around 2000, and 2000, 2000, 2001, that I just discovered something in my bone. You know, it was just a tiny, small growth, you know. Three years back, I discovered that it's growing bigger and bigger every day. A friend posted something on WhatsApp, and I saw it, that a certain um, group known as BOA, um, Benjamin, a lower Jebutu foundation is coming to acquire them to do free surgery. Those that attended to me, they were so nice, fantastic people. I recovered immediately because I had to drive myself back home that same day. Sometimes people don't believe that things like this can happen for free. I didn't pay a dime. I mean, Nigeria, it's, it's, it's rare, it's rare. It's an amazing feeling. You know when you see people that have gone through stuff for years and you kind of sort them out? It's gratifying for me, very. For now, Surely, the presence of people like Dr. Oluo Jebutu offering free health care at great personal cost is a measure of how far we still have to go. Aquaibom is a specimen study, so let's broaden the discussion with our specialists at the United Hearts Hospital, Lagos. Dr. Wosu is the chief executive of United Heart Hospital, an American-trained consultant cardiologist who recently relocated to Nigeria from his base in Savannah, Georgia, where he practiced medicine for 33 years. Why did you come back to Nigeria and what were the challenges you faced um, trying to take, make that huge, that very sacrificial move down to this country? It's not an easy undertaking. And I can tell you that if you look at the physical, you will never come back to Nigeria. It doesn't make any sense. We, we are comfortable. Um, we have traveled the world. We have seen poor countries, rich countries. We know what life is all about. So um, if you look at the infrastructure, no light, no electricity, chaotic environment, indiscipline, no policy, just, you know, nothing. You will never come back to Nigeria. So I would say coming back is a spiritual exercise. The, the biggest challenge coming back to Nigeria is the human resources. It's not there. I'm talking about even the young doctors you recruit, um, the nurses, the you know, front desk, name it. The, the attitude to work. The, we, we don't value people's time, you know, um, customer service is not there, zero. it is zero. So all those things that give you a wonderful experience, mm -hmm. even the, the tangibles, the ambience, the environment, to try to create those things here is difficult, but it's not 
on some one table. Okay, Doc, let's, let's move forward. Let's talk about medical tourism in Nigeria. Nigeria, mm -hmm. this is about $1 billion you know, annually to medical tourism, according to you say it. Mm -hmm. um, are you optimistic that medical centers such as yours will also change um, the scenario, for instance? Yes. Uh, um, let me say this. I am very optimistic that in the next five years, the medical services in Nigeria will improve because people are realizing and big money is also coming in. People are investing in medical services. How can a common man like me okay. access this place and are, are able to afford the facilities you have here? Because it seems well equipped as well. Okay, you are making a good point. Um, let me say this to you. That is a big challenge, okay? Um, we cannot offer services for free here. Uh, you, you can see the power here is 24 hours, it's air conditioned, you know, all that stuff. We, we have to do that because quality cannot be compromised. I did not come back from the United States to bring the quality down. Look at it this way. Do you now blame those hospitals for not accepting a patient because they don't have the money? You should not because Every single thing that is needed for that is important, and it's big money. All those companies, Metronics, the catheters, the stent, and everything. If they do it for free, they won't have money for the next case. Okay, so what is the solution for the The solution is policy. Policy. The policy to improve healthcare and make it accessible is not there. We should have an good health insurance system. Dr. Doherty is a U.S. board certified pediatric and public health physician with a vast experience in supporting development in our communities. My background is in public health, but it's also in pediatrics. I'm primarily a pediatrician and I consider myself a community pediatrician. I think that uh, a few things are, are key. People have a lot of difficulty determining where to go for health services, um, where to go for what health services. A lot of the time people don't have a primary care doctor who can direct them or navigate the system for them. The other thing of course is that, and it's tied into the first, is the lack of trust. So in a low trust environment we know that, but it permeates everything that we are and that we do. So people don't know necessarily if where they are going um, people are going to have their best interests at hand. The good thing about primary health care is that primary health care is the least expensive of all forms of health care. And when you have good primary health care, then you can make additional health care even more affordable because you can catch it early. You can identify this child has a murmur, we need to take a look at the heart. Before you have a child who is in heart failure, who then needs drugs, maybe medications and uh, uh, a lot more sort of interventions and then surgery, whereas you could have picked it up very early and said, this child has a murmur, let's take a look, and let's follow. Okay, but then again, I still want to ask you, are you really telling us that you're satisfied with the healthcare system in Nigeria? Because you seem to be balancing everything all up and I don't think that is uh, it's, it's uh, right information you're giving out there. <laughs> so don't let me give you the impression that everything is honky dory with the healthcare system and I'm pleased with everything. Um, but we shouldn't um, ignore the work that has been done, perhaps especially in the last decade, around healthcare reforms, readdressing um, through the, for example, the National Healthcare Bill, um, the options to ensure that Nigerians can be provided for. Um, but we are a large country. We also have the largest number of people living in poverty and healthcare comes at a cost. Healthcare is not only um, immunization, it's also basic sanitation in your home. How do you store your water? How do you make sure you're not breeding mosquitoes? How do you, how do you? Those things are also important. What do you do with a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old? How do you make a house safe? Some of the household childhood poisonings that we see are because mothers didn't know any better. They store kerosene on the floor when they should store it in a place where it's out of reach of the child. So there are many things that we should be doing, but we haven't done them. And we have failed to do them over a long period so that we now have two, three generations of people, mothers, fathers, who don't even know how to keep a home safe. Dr. Okulaja is a director of advocacy and communications 
Farm Access Foundation. He is a member of the Lagos State core team on the implementation of the Lagos State Health Insurance Scheme. I want to take you back to a recent conference you attended some time back. Yeah. And you said, and I quote, that unless we treat healthcare delivery as a business, it would essentially be an endangered species. What does that mean? You see, um, one of the basic failures of the system as it is, is because healthcare has been seen as a service, as a social service. However, if it is regarded as a business and it is seen as an investment that can yield positive returns, then people's attention become more intrigued. For example, you look at the UK, the NHS. The NHS is the largest employer of labor in the UK. Nigeria is currently the highest in maternal mortality in the world and child mortality in but the world. After giving me all the statistics, and why do we still invest so little? Because healthcare is largely intangible. So, for example, a person comes into a government and one of the things he wants to do is to build a bridge. Why does he want to build a bridge? The reason he wants to build a bridge is so that when it's time for the next election, he's able to tell people that I built you that bridge. And it's what people can see. Let's talk about the healthcare um, insurance scheme. So, you see, the journey of health insurance did not just start. It started in 1999 by the General Luce Gwambasonjo regime when he passed the bill, but the real operations of the NHIS started at about 2005, mm -hmm. right? But you see, in the implementation of the NHIS, there were a lot of fundamental issues, which I must admit, and I would say, that the NHIS itself have recognized and are making huge steps to rectifying. I think everyone needs a mind renewal. It starts from government in terms of policy, right? So one of the things that we need to promote in health is decentralization of the delivery of healthcare service. Two, governments must also realize that they cannot do it alone. On the side of the private sector, there also has to be a renewal of the mind that look, beyond the rich people, beyond the 1% of the population that earns above $10,000 a year, there are also about 99% that are still uncovered and still an untapped source of financing for them. The population also needs to understand the, 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 the trajectory of healthcare delivery in the country and also to understand that, you know, we need to take care of the poor because if we don't take care of the poor, the poor will take care of us. So I'll tell you a story and I'll use that story to uh, explain um, why I said that. One day I'd just come back from one of my numerous trips and I got into my car and I was trying to drive out of Ikeja Ikeja um, terminal and there was a bit of traffic and all of a sudden a guy comes to my window and he knocks very hard bah, bah, bah. and I looked up I said what do you want? He said give me money I looked at this guy properly dressed sleeves rolled up he was tucked in had trousers and shirt on and I said I'm not giving you any money he said you better give me money now or else I'm going to turn it for you I said, you better do whatever you want to do right now because I'm not giving you a dime, right? And we went through that conversation for a bit until the traffic moved. And I was thinking, what gave me the audacity to do what I did? And what gave him the audacity to do what he did? And I said, it's just one thing. Self-preservation. That is the poor. And if we are not careful, one day, he will not wait to ask me. He will take it. Our healthcare system is clearly an area that needs scrutiny as well as investment. Now it's time to join our special guest as we take you on the journey. Take me again. Okay, Moi Oluwa Oluwa Shoyun, or Arike as she's known, may well be considered a child protege. She began handling a camera at the age of three. That is, if you don't count the toy camera she had at the age of one. Five years on, she has a portfolio that would make many professional photographers envious. Arike, welcome to the journey. Thank you. Tell me, how did you start? I started when I was one. 
Hmm. How? One. You I could identify where the camera is on your daddy's phone or? No. I started with a toy camera. Okay. So my grandma gave me a hood camera. Oh, your grandma had a camera? Is she a photographer? Yes, she is. She is a photographer. <laughs> okay, go on. Grandma, when I was five, my dad bought me my fifth camera. Toy? No. Real he, camera? Yes. Wow. So that's how I started taking pictures. Pictures. You started studying your daddy, handling cameras. Your daddy's a photographer as well. Yes. So how has the journey been for you? It has been fine. Very interesting. Tell me, have you taken bigger, bigger pictures that is probably celebrated everywhere yet? Or you're yet to do that? Yes, I am yet to do that. Oh, okay. So you're still you're still in a work in progress. So tell me, did your dad support you? Of yes, course, he you did. Have for buying you cameras and all of that. Yes, he mm. did. So how is school? Do you do your school school and your photography at the same time? My parents and my sibling support me, mm -hmm. so I can have time to play, mm -hmm. to to ride my bicycle, to swim with my friends, and to play chess with my friends. You play chess? Yes, I do. Wow, you're particularly good, good with everything. So let's talk about your, your school. Um, your friends in school, do they consider you very special? How do they look at you in school? Your teachers? They, they look at me as a normal child. So um, let's talk about you being one of the participants in the Spelling Bee contest. How is that for you? It's so amazing. <laughs> Tell me about it. We won the first stage. I pray we win the second stage. Okay. We are only five doing the spellings. Only five? And the spelling was so nice and simple. Mm. So like you could spell, spell objective. Objective is spelled O B J E C T I V E. Objective. Spell superficial. <laughs> you said you're one of the five person. So tell me, what photograph have you taken that is special for you? The last EMVCA award. Oh, you were there. Yes. Who did you take? I took my daddy with me. Oh, you did. You took your daddy with you. How? Yeah. No, I'm talking about the photograph. Did you take anybody in the last AMVCA? Yes, I did. Is that special for who was the person? Do you mm. remember? Was that special for you? I forgot the name of the person. Well, oh, so that wasn't special then. It was special. <laughs> okay, so one last question to go. Do you like? Do you? Are there any other, any other interests apart from photography? Mm, I love swimming. Mm hmm. I love riding bicycle with my sister and my dad. Let's talk about your sister. My sister, my sister is six. Okay. She's my best friend. Okay. So does she accompany you when you want to do your sessions? She does. Yes. Okay. So you're just two in your family. You are four. Tell me, who are who? Me and my dad. Mm -hmm. Me, my mom, my sister, and. Me. Okay, you're four in <laughs> number. Okay, thank you so much for coming on the show, my darling. So, uh, are you going to take uh, Auntie Mona Lisa some pictures before we round up for today? Okay. More pictures. Done. Can I see that? Come. Let's see. Awesome. Wow. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, my darling Arike. I wish you all the best and I pray that you would succeed in this particular talent of yours, all right? Yes. Yes. In a world where talent is often neglected, and everyday demands stifle the drive to be the best we can be. It is possible that we forget that we are all winners in the pursuit of excellence, whether in the area of our healthcare system or photography. Doctors Eugene Wosu and Orode Doherty raised the critical dilemma of affordability of healthcare, essentially saying that good healthcare comes with a price tag. Who will fit the bill? All eyes on the national healthcare insurance scheme. But then, why does this seem to be moving in a snail's pace? 
Dr. Lamide Okualaja is a practical revolutionary and warns us that if we don't take care of the poor, the poor will take care of us. Chilling. At whose table does this duty of care fall? Akwaibom have set out their store. They are providing free health care for women, children, and the elderly, whilst targeting the medical tourism market. My takeaways are that a medical revolution begins with being informed of what type of care is available and where, whether primary, secondary, or tertiary. We need to practice preventive health care in our homes. Beyond our homes, we are all to become advocates of our health care system, petitioning our local and state executives on the key issues of accessible and affordable health care. When all is said and done, no one needs to tell us that health is wealth. The fact and our high mortality rates speak for themselves. In the meantime, let's celebrate young Moi Oluwa as a promising glimpse of what the future holds. She's an inspiration to me and to you. That if we nurture our talents individually, collectively we can become a great nation against all odds. That's all we have time for on this edition of Mona Lisa. I know it has been as informative and enriching for you as it has been for me. Till next time, stay healthy, keep investing in yourself, body, soul and spirit. You are worth it.